Hello and welcome to Williams Hall. I'm Chase Engel. Tonight, the Miami University Department of Media, Journalism and Film is pleased to welcome for conversation Tommy Evans, Vice President and London Bureau Chief for CNN. Evans oversees all news gathering for CNN in Europe, the Middle East and East Africa, managing 14 news bureaus. During his time at CNN, Evans has led coverage of a number of major news events, including Brexit, terror attacks across Europe, the conflict in Ukraine, and the ongoing refugee crisis in Syria. He started his career at CNN as a producer for AC360 with Anderson Cooper, and later headed the network's Baghdad Bureau. Evans earned a master's degree in international politics from the University of London, and bachelor's degrees in political science and fine arts from the University of Rochester. Our conversation with Tommy Evans will be moderated tonight by Joe Sampson, senior clinical faculty in the Department of Media, Journalism, and Film. Please join me in welcoming Tommy Evans. Well, thank you, Chase, for that introduction. And let me add my uh, welcome as well to, to Tommy and uh, welcome to, to Miami University, but uh, welcome you. back to Butler County as yeah. well as, as we'll talk about. Uh, I'd also like to welcome our audience watching live on MUTV and, and uh, extend a welcome to our studio audience here. So tonight, uh, our format uh, sort of breaks into, into two parts over the next hour. Uh, I will moderate a discussion with Tommy uh, as we look at um, examples of CNN reporting across the globe that he has managed, uh, taking us uh, uh, to Af from Africa to the Middle East. Uh, and beyond. Um, and so we'll uh, look at those excerpts of those stories and talk about that coverage. Uh, and then we'll open it up to, to questions from the audience and we will make sure that we have time for that. And uh, Chase will, will help facilitate that uh, when we call for questions. Uh, we'll have a microphone that we'll, we'll pass around. Again, this is a live broadcast, so we want to make sure that our audience watching can hear as well as uh, those of us here in the studio. So uh, I want to kind of start by taking a step back, uh, Tommy. Chase gave us a, an overview of your career and your academic uh, career in college as well. But um, maybe kind of a, 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 an obvious but important question to begin is uh, what drew you to journalism? Well, it, it sounds a bit cliche, but it, it very early in my, in my career, I, and I sort of the beginning of my career, I sort of fell into journalism. I, I was living in New York and, and freelancing and, and writing and, and basically just trying to pay rent. Um, and uh, it's addictive. It's, it's, uh, you know, there are very few jobs where you have that's that, the, the same type of adrenaline and the same type of pressure, which I, I enjoyed and strived on. And then very early in my career, 9-11 happened. And um, this is where the cliche comes in. It's, it's, there's very few jobs where you have a front row seat to history. And you know, it's difficult and it doesn't, often doesn't pay very well and often has very long hours, but it's, you know, at the end of the day, you feel like you've done something that matters, which, mm -hmm. which mattered to me. I wanted to actually be doing something that, uh, um, that was of, of benefit to more than just paying my rent. Mm -hmm. Uh, how about uh, what draws you to uh, international journalism as an American based in London overseeing uh, 14 bureaus across the globe? Uh, I grew up overseas. I, I, my family um, was in Asia most of my, my childhood. Um, but uh, international news, I just, I just I, I find the world fascinating. I like different people. I like different cultures. I like to travel. Um, I like going places and meeting um, people who are, who are who are more different than me than I can imagine, and yet fundamentally so similar. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, and I like telling those types of stories and telling people stories. And it's amazing how often um, you know, conflicts can be broken down just just when people get to know each other a bit better. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's, it's in international news. It's, it's also just a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It's like you get to go go crazy places and see <laughs> crazy things. And, mm -hmm. um, it, it, again, it's amazing. It's frighteningly addictive, so I, d I wouldn't recommend it to everybody because it can be, <laughs> can be hazardous to your health as well. Talk a little bit about in your current role, based in London, but having to manage 14 bureaus across three continents. How how do you begin to think about placing resources, and especially in, in a time when a lot of news organizations are, are contracting? Yeah. Um, I, we talked earlier that it sounds like fortunately that's not the case right now at CNN, but still the idea that 
that you've, you've got these 14 bureaus and, and you've got, you know, almost like, I would think like chess pieces on a yeah, board absolutely. and you've got to think about how you're going to allocate those resources. So how does that work? It, it's tough and it's what makes the job difficult. Um, yeah, CNN is, unlike a lot of news organizations, we, we aren't pulling back our international reach, but we're also not expanding greatly. I, mean, I could use another, you know, easily 10 producers and cameramen and, and correspondents. I, uh, there's, there's never enough. Um, we, we do deal with finite resources. I think CNN's quite good that we sometimes project bigger than we are because mm -hmm. people seem we're everywhere all the time and a lot of that is down to um, really good planning and, and aggressively chasing, getting to stories and, and mm -hmm. being there as, as quickly as possible. Um, so yeah, I'm responsible for 14 bureaus across Europe, Africa, the Middle East. Um, and, you know, Africa alone is just massive. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that the, the pure logistics challenges, I think a lot of people realize that uh, there's not a lot of good internal flights within Africa, so sometimes it's very difficult to travel. Um, I remember, as, you, know, you also have to sort of think about the world in a different way. Um, for, exa you know, for example, a big story in Lagos a little while back, and I needed to get more correspondence in there. I actually pulled somebody out of Rio because it's closer the closest uh, inter uh, international city. It's only a four hour flight from Rio to Lagos. Mm -hmm. um, when we had an attack in Mali, I pulled a team from Paris because Paris is closer to Mali than Johannesburg. That's how big Africa is. It's just purely just figuring out, you know, geography is, a, you know, if you want to go to international news, geography will be your best friend, like learning how, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it, it is moving chess pieces, getting things around as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. I would imagine there's the additional challenge, especially in the environment that we find ourselves in now, that you almost have to plan and then for something you can anticipate. If, if you take somebody out of Rio, for example, and, and send them, as oh, you yeah. said, to Lagos, then you, you're, something happens in Rio that you can't anticipate, then you, are you maybe sending them right back to where they came yeah. from? Or? That, that happens all the time. Um, the, the, the most recent example, when the, there was a terror attack in Nice, I actually went to Nice myself to, to, to cover it, and I remember sitting on, on, you know, on the waterfront in Nice on a phone, and my, my, uh, on one phone and my other phone, it started blowing up because it's that, that night there was a, a coup in Turkey, and we had pulled our resources from Turkey to get to Nice, and we had to turn people right around and go back to, to Turkey because no one, no one saw a coup coming. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how often we have massive international stories happening at the same time. I mean, the, mm -hmm. When MH17 was shot down in Ukraine, um, it was the same day the Israelis went into Gaza uh, last time. So it was you know, trying to cover two massive stories in my region at the same time. Is, it, it can be quite challenging. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll uh, go to our first example. Again, we have uh, five stories that we're going to look at uh, excerpts from. Uh, we don't have time. To, uh, to look at the full piece, but I would encourage particularly our students to go to CNN.com. That's the first of many plugs. Well, thank you. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and look for the, the full versions of these stories. We're just editing them down simply for time tonight. But our, but our first story takes us to the Balkans. Uh, everybody in this room knows about, um, you know, um, this, the influence that, and I almost hate to use the word fake news because I think it in many ways it's sort of, um, devalues the work that journalists do every day. Um, but um, nevertheless, uh, just recently, uh, Facebook uh, representatives uh, testifying before Congress uh, told the American people that um, uh, upwards of 125 million Americans were exposed to uh, political advertising during the 2016 election that was uh, paid for and, and produced by Russian-backed operatives. More recently, the London Times is, is reporting that 150,000 Twitter accounts uh, created by the, by the Russian uh, government uh, uh, and sort of released in the days before the Brexit vote in the UK and having a significant impact on how the UK voted, obviously, in favor to leave the EU. So with that as sort of the context, I'll have you talk a little bit about our first story set in Macedonia. And what's fascinating about this story is I think those of us in the audience know that these things are happening. We read about them, but in the story, we actually get to see sort of the faces behind who's creating this content. Yeah. Uh, do you all run the piece? Yeah, we'll go ahead and roll okay. the clip, and then we'll talk about it. 
we are driven out of the city centre and taken to an industrial part of town, all to protect the identity of a man who says he is one of the pioneers of fake news in Vélez. To the first office, lights off. Mikhail has arrived. He's logged in to his website and I've noticed that it's not your own name. No, it's, it's someone just, else's profile. That, that we are doing all the time. Well, right. We are faking uh, fake numbers to have fake uh, accounts so I can reach more and more people. Right, so here you're Jessica. A lot of people commenting but also a lot of people sharing as, as we're talking, a lot of people here liking your posts. What are you working on now? What are you looking ahead to now? My primary goal is to prepare a site that I, like I was having before mm. to be ready for the next election um, in America. US election? In the US, yeah. How do you prepare for something like that? Sim what are you looking at? Simply, you need to make a million fan page. Like you see, Jessica, it's a fake. Uh, a lot of fake pages, a lot of fake numbers, because I, at the beginning you need to do that to make people like your page. I know how it is to build a big site and I will do it again. I can tell you how much money I have earned in one day. Mm. Maybe it was around two, 2000 2500 dollars at one day. For this kind of money to earning per day, you need to have maybe a fan page more than half a million million people. What makes a good clickable story in your opinion? So you need to have an interesting topic. Whatever Donald Trump is doing, it's interesting for everyone. Even in my country, everything he said, it's worth listening, you know? He's an interesting face. When you have million fans, if you post something, even if it's not interesting, a lot of them will open it just to see what it is, and you will get money. You don't know if it's true or not? I don't know, and I don't care. Right. Because the people are reading. Even if they open, I'm getting paid. Are you proud of what you've achieved? Uh, in 22 years, I was earning more than someone that will never earn in his entire life with the standard that we have in my country. So, yes, I'm proud. So, again, that's just an excerpt from the longer piece. Um, I'm wondering if you can kind of take us inside how this story, uh, some of the logistics, how your reporter uh, found uh, the source, how um, she gained the trust, and sort of how you were able to to, to uh, put the story together that we just watched? Well, it took us four months. Um, uh, Issa, the reporter, and I came up with the idea. Well, we knew these, we knew, um, we knew these sort of, you know, the, the, these fake news stories that were, that were showing up on Facebook. We could trace them down. It was quite easy to trace them back to Macedonia. Um, so we knew where they were coming from, and, and largely coming from the same town in Macedonia, which is quite remarkable. Um, so the, the, it was, we figured out where it was coming from, and, and going back to your, your early thing about this fake news is, you know, there's, it, it's a, it is a, an awkward sort of statement because it, there, there's fake news like this, which is a, in this particular case in Macedonia, these are very economically depressed areas. These kids are, this is a purely financial um, operation for them. He's making like from 500 euros to 1,000 euros a day in a place where he would, wouldn't make that in a month. Um, so there's a, there's a huge financial incentive for him to do this. He doesn't, they don't really care what they're saying. They just want you to click. They just want clickbait. And they figured out that American politics, especially Trump politics, was seemed to generate the clicks. Um, th 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 that's one type of fake news. And then the other type of fake news is when you know, people, uh, politicians, and not just in the U.S., it's, it's spreading everywhere recently. Uh, just just yesterday, he, the, the Egyptians sort of accused people of fake news in this this mosque attack in Sinai. It's when government officials hear things that they don't like, and so it's easier mm. to to just brush aside than actually deal with with what people really say, which is frustrating. But um, this story, so it took us for four months. Um, we went to Macedonia about three or four times, and it took it. It just takes a lot of work talking to a lot of people, meeting a lot of people over coffee, you know, tr trying to explain to them what you are and, and, and why you're doing the story, and the fact you know we weren't sort of we weren't the police, mm -hmm. um, and so it, it a lot of journalism is just building trust and getting people to, to speak to you, especially television journalism. It's it's really difficult. The camera may, the camera's not your friend. Mm -hmm. 
for investigative journalism. People don't want to talk in front of a camera. They'll tell print reporters stuff uh, before they'll tell t TV reporters stuff, just because the camera changes the dynamic. Mm -hmm. So it takes it took a lot, a lot of work mm -hmm. to uh, to get these guys to open up. Mm -hmm. What type of reaction did uh, your audience did you see from your your audience to this really sort of intimate? portrait of something, again, that we all know exists, but you take us behind the scenes. That piece, the, the final piece is about 13 minutes long. Mm -hmm. It's quite long. Yeah. Um, we ran it on air a few times. We, we obviously posted it on, on, online. Um, you know, there are people out there who say you know, that, that people's attention span isn't great for, for digesting something that long. That 13-minute that piece, the first 24 hours, got something like 17 million hits. Mm. And we can tell how long people watch for, and it was something like people were watching, on average, like 89% completion rate. So uh, I think it, it really sort of uh, touched a nerve with people because it, it, it was such a dominant force within the, the last election. You know, you, mm -hmm. I think everyone here, including myself, you open your Facebook page and you saw stuff that you, know, you had no idea where it was coming from, you know, or organizations you never heard of and stories mm -hmm. that were obviously questionable. Any sense that uh, these uh, kids, really, teenagers yeah. in Macedonia, are, are really uh, now thinking about, thinking forward, thinking that this was pretty successful? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And 2020 is now on the radar screen as they're well. They're looking at 2020. They looked at, um, they, there was a lot of it was during for the French election, um, the, the German election, the Austrian election. It's not, it's not exclusively, it's not just an, an American problem. It's really a global problem. It's a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our next story is a good reminder of the dangers that journalists faced reporting stories, especially reporting international stories. And we might talk about this a little bit later, but the protections that journalists enjoy in this country, whether it be constitutional protections or protections through the courts, may not exist in other parts of the world. Uh, um, maybe after we watch this clip, we can talk a little bit about that, generally speaking. But this story uh, is a really harrowing uh, story about a young girl who fell under the um, auspice of, of ISIS and, uh, and was rescued. And uh, ISIS, of course, takes its name from its presence in Iraq and Syria. Uh, it's worth noting that the Committee to Protect Journalists right now says that those are the two most dangerous countries in the world for journalists to operate. Uh, and so let's take a look at the excerpt of, of um, the story about a young girl who, who was uh, uh, sort of rescued uh, from the throes of ISIS, and then we'll talk about it. We saw these 13 bodies, and we saw movement. Here they are. Look at that wall. A man, alive, and a little girl who creeps out from under her dead mother's hijab, where she'd been hiding for two days, hugging her mother's corpse. They used the tank for cover to move out, dragging those they just saved past the corpses of those who perished. The little girl, she has not yet spoken, not a single word. No one even knows her name. So again, even in just that short excerpt, we really see the, you know, the, the inherent dangers of, involved in this. So uh, as the managing editor on this assignment, I wonder if you could talk about the planning for what you assumed would be a risky uh, story and then, and then sort of how this played out. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rock and Series has sort of been largely my area of, 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 of expertise. That's where I did most of, I was in, in Baghdad for five years during the height of the war. Mm -hmm. um, that reporter, Arwa Damon, and I were, were roommates in Baghdad. Um, uh, it's, you can never mitigate all the risk. It's, it's impossible. Um, we do have, uh, in, in, unfortunately, it's gotten to the point that these conflicts have been going on for so long that we have some people who have incredible experience, incredible um, war zone experience, mm -hmm. um, Arwa being one of them. Um, we have very good contacts in, in Iraq and Syria because we've been going back and because we, we, I think I'm quite proud of that CNN hasn't abandoned that mm -hmm. either story, either Iraq or Syria. Um, and so we have a really good network of, sort of local support and people we trust. Um, it's, but the, you know, the, the you'll never sort of, uh, it'll never be risk-free. Mm -hmm. I mean, Libya, 
Um, my sort of generation of reporters, we were all in, in Iraq together. I went to Libya and you know, I lost four friends in, in three months in Libya. And these were guys who were extremely experienced. Um, it's, it, 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 no, no story's worth dying for, but um, no story's worth dying for. But some stories, you know, to, to tell them you're, you are gonna risk everything. Mm -hmm. About more of a, a general question about, as I said earlier, that you know, American journalists in this country, we have the tradition of, of some protections mm. that, that, that journalists can rely on, yeah. you know, the court system, for example. But I'm imagining, as you dispatch uh, journalists in different parts of the world, that may not be the case. Mm. So is that a conversation that you have in, 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 when, in planning or in logistics? Um, you know, you hope that you don't run afoul of, of a local government, but if you do, you know, what, what type of options are you looking at if there's not an embassy, for example? Uh, and, and, and these days, I, I'm not sure how much help uh, the embassy would, would mm -hmm. grant us. It depends on who, my, most people work, work for me are, are you know, from all sorts of countries. Some countries are, are, are more helpful than others. Um, just last week covering Zimbabwe, our cameraman was arrested. Um, and basically, uh, we had to stop everything, and, and, and in fact, may we stop our coverage until we could negotiate his release from a, 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 a Zimbabwe police station. Um, it's covering international news. The, the, we are often in in places where they they don't understand the free press. They the government doesn't want you there to to be telling the story. Um, you're viewed as rather than as, as neutral, uh, but you're, you're viewed as, as combatants. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that, that's why you can sort of see there, wa there was an era in, in you know, the 60s and 70s when you see journalists with press written across their, their, their chest. We don't do that anymore because pe you will get sh people will shoot at you. Yeah, you're a target. Yeah. 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 Next story, um, as you, we were talking earlier, is, is actually quite close, to, <laughs> literally mm -hmm. quite close to your home. Uh, many folks will remember in June um, a terrible apartment fire in West London at the Grenfell apartment complex uh, took 71 lives. Uh, and we want to look at a, an excerpt of some of the reporting on this. This is a story, of course, that got uh, coverage from news organizations all over the world. But some really <laughs> harrowing video inside this clip that we'll talk about after we, we take a look. Thing around here now that's built that doesn't even have sprinklers, or at least an alarm that worked. All you could hear that night was people screaming. That was it. There were people at windows up there who were just screaming the whole time about, you know, for people to help them. I honestly don't. It looks to me like it's only the outside bit. Oh, my God. Oh, Jesus, that's where the stairs are. No. Oh my god. Oh my god. One woman fears that she's lost six relatives, including her mother and sister and three nieces. They all lived on the 22nd floor. How do you want your family to be remembered? Love, memories, pictures, and everything. So as we were talking earlier, your bureau in London mm. is, is how close to Grenfell? Very close. Uh, to less than two miles. Less than two yeah, miles. It's, it's not far. A lot, a lot of people in the bureau live, in that, live nearby, mm. um, sort of like the next neighborhood over. Mm. Uh, it, London, in the last year, we've, we've had a lot of terror attacks and a lot of news sort of breaking in our backyard. And it's always difficult sort of covering this, these things because it's not just covering a news story. You're covering your, your neighbors and your friends, and, and you know people impacted. Um, that, you know, it sounds probably odd that I picked this story about a, 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 a an apartment building fire. I mean, it was a horrific apartment building fire, but the, the sort of the ramifications of that, uh, mm. the, the sort of ripple effects from that fire, this is, it, it, it was in one of the wealthiest areas in town. It was run by the local government. Um, they didn't, didn't have proper fire procedures, and most people living in that building were, were refugees, were people who had been put into sort of social housing. Um, I think that I actually believe that 71 number is is low because mm -hmm. I think there were a lot of people they didn't really know how many people were in that building. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, 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 that the reaction, the public reaction, almost brought down the government mm -hmm. because it was so mishandled. I mean, it, it just shows that that 
that all news is local in a sense, and yet all news can, can have regional and, and, mm -hmm. and massive ramifications. I wanted to ask you about, uh, in the excerpt we watched, some difficult video. Yeah. Um, we were hearing, you know, screams. Yeah. We, you know, we, we may be hearing sort of the last moments of, 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 of lives there, and then, and then the video of the fire itself. So you have in, sort of internal discussions. I guess two questions. Where did you, where'd you get that video? Did you guys shoot it or somebody provide it? And then also, what kind of discussions do you have, you know, almost on the, the question of, the, you know, using that? Yeah. That type of video. Um, that video was shot by actually the gentleman who's being interviewed at the top mm -hmm. of the, that clip. He, he shot that video on his mm -hmm. phone and he gave it to us. Um, we do have very uh, heated debates on, on what we use, you know, what we use, and where. Actually, in, in some places where we broadcast, like the UK, there are actually there are actually strict legal guidelines mm -hmm. on when what you can show and what you can't show. Um, I personally, I, I, I tend to to feel that that. Um, we shouldn't desensitize people too much. I think a lot of, especially um, when I was in the field and, and covering Iraq, I had a, uh, an issue of, of sanitizing war coverage because I think people then didn't get the reality of what, what, they were actu what was actually going on. Mm -hmm. um, I think that this, that story in particular, you know, because it was just so horrible and just, uh, there was, it was unnecessary that that building went up because mm -hmm. of neglect, um, I think that that, and there are hundreds of buildings like that London. in London that needed to, to mm -hmm. be fixed so that this didn't happen again. So there was a sort of social imperative to show this is how horrible it was. This is, this is, this is how these people couldn't escape because mm -hmm. you guys neglected them and abandoned them. Yeah. That sort of leads me to a, a final question before we move on to our next uh, example. Uh, can you uh, kind of update us on, on where uh, the, the local government is, uh, you're right in saying that the concern, of course, is we have other Grenfell Towers, yeah. you know, almost like a, a disaster, another disaster waiting to, to, to happen. Uh, so um, where is that story now for, you know, the American audience who may have remembered it, but, but now maybe not paying attention to it? Uh, it this are twofold. One, the, you know, a lot of the buildings are being, being retrofitted and, and they're putting in fire, you know, uh, sprinkler systems and, and the, the, the casing on the outside of the building was, was flammable. And the difference between the, the, the version that, that was flame retardant and the version of the building was, it was something ridiculous, like less than a thousand pounds of building the price difference. There was mm -hmm. absolutely no reason why they should have done this. So there are, there are a lot of repair work being, going on in the, in the buildings. And the political ramifications, are, the, the fallout's still continuing. I mean, Theresa May's government uh, is, is hanging by a thread. And this is, this is a, not an insignificant reason for it. This is certainly one of the massive strikes against her. Mm -hmm. Uh, our <coughs> final two examples, uh, we're sort of spanning the globe here, <laughs> uh, take us to Africa, the first of which is a story that just in the last few days has gotten quite a bit of attention. Um, it's almost, uh, uh, it's just remarkable to say this, but the reporting on an active uh, slave market in Libya, um, we're going <coughs> to take a look at, 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 at a clip from, from that story, but I'm wondering if you might want to set this, give a little bit of context to this and set it up. So, uh, you know, Libya, it, after the fall of is, is largely a failed state. It's, it's run by tribal regions, but it's also become the easiest place for the African migrants to try to, try to um, leave to, to get to Europe. Uh, the closest Italian I island is only about mm, less than about 90 miles off the shore of Libya, so it's not a particularly far distance to, to hit European soil, um, and it's largely lawless. So a lot of African migrants come up through Libya and try to get on boats. Um, while they're there, though, um, some pretty horrible things can happen to them. Yeah, um, let's take a look. <coughs> One by one, men are brought out as the bidding begins. 400. 500. 550. 600. 650. 700. Very quickly, it's over. That was over very quickly. We walked in. And as soon as we walked in, the men started covering their faces, but they clearly wanted to finish what they were doing. And they kept bringing out what they kept referring to in Arabic as al-Buda'a, the merchandise. All in all, 
they admitted to us that there were 12 Nigerians that were sold in front of us. And I, I honestly don't know what to say. That was probably one of the most unbelievable things I've ever seen. Sure. Tell us. I was sold. What happened? On my way coming, I was sold. Merciless beating. If you look at most of the people here, if you check their body, you see the mark, they're beating. With the electric, even your boot or they took something, something like a sharp object. Understand? Most of them lost their life there. So even in the stand up, the, mm. the reporter there, so, you know, in her tone, in her voice, they, mm. so she's almost incredulous. She, she, she's here. You know, journalists are often described as witnesses. They write the first draft of history, of eyewitnesses to history as it unfolds. But still, it's almost as if, you know, this disbelief that I just saw what yeah. we came here thinking we'd find, but I'm wondering if you could talk about um, sort of how this story, you know, first came uh, on your radar and then how you planned for it. Um, yeah, so Nema, who's the reporter there, and I um, both did a lot of work, a lot of work in, in Libya over the years and in, in Tripoli, um, and, uh, and her producer Raja as well was and Raja first started hearing these rumors about the, these slave markets in the, in the Western Mountains, about nine hours sort of southwest of Tripoli. Um, and we'd gotten some very, somebody had showed us some very sort of um, grainy cell phone video. It, it, that, I mean, it looked like a, a slave auction, but we, you know, we sort of had to go, we had to go for ourselves. Um, uh, Nema is, is Sudanese and speaks fluent Arabic, so it was, Quite uh, and Rand Rasha speaks Arabic, so and actually sometimes women um, in the Middle East uh, sort of sometimes surprises people. It's easier for them to sort of slip in because they, a lot of times they're just people pay as close attention, mm. um, and and because of uh, it, depending where you are, if you're wearing a hijab, it sort of conceals you a bit. So if you don't mm. quite look the part, you you have some some covering. So they we sent them down. Um, they're not alone, but they actually went into the, 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 the auction alone with uh, some hidden cameras. Um, and it was stunning. It was like one of the things that we, you know, often you, you're looking for these stories and, and sometimes you don't really expect to, to, to find it that sort of dramatically. Did, yeah. you know, uh, it was as, as bad as we feared. Mm -hmm. uh, in the short time th since the story is aired, there's been a rather remarkable um, response to this. I think this is one of the reasons why um, folks get into journalism to try and affect positive change. So for example, uh, the, the UN has, just in the last couple of days, has sort of chimed in on this, yeah. the Libyan government. Uh, so I wonder if you, um, I know that, I don't know that that was the, in the intention for going in, but it has to sort of, in, in some ways, um, validate, in a certain sense, the what you found and what you reported yeah, out. Yeah, in, in a sense, it is kind of the intention. You, you want to, you know, if, if something's fundamentally wrong, I mean, it's, it's, it's 2017 and, and mm -hmm. open slave markets, it, it's fundamentally wrong. Yeah. Um, and so it, on one hand, it's our job to sort of point that out, and it, it, is, it is satisfying to, to have such an instant response. Because I think it's, it is one, you know, a, what, what, what little of the Libyan government is, was, is equally appalled. You know, they have a tough time, you know, the country's in, the, in a bad state and they have a tough time running it, but the Libyan officials, when they saw our footage, were as appalled as anybody would be. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they don't want this happening in their country any more than anyone else does. Mm -hmm. Uh, final example we're going to look at, and then we'll have time for questions from the audience. Uh, stay in Africa, a, a much more uplifting story <laughs> uh, about uh, really terrific footage, a great television story about mm. um, uh, elephants in Malawi being relocated to, to a new home. So let's take a look at that excerpt, and then we'll talk about it. The chase led from the air. Copied on our way. Capture teams at the ready. This is conservation on its absolute largest scale. A record translocation. Not just a single elephant, entire herds darted. We need to take a cohesive family group, right from the oldest matriarch down to the smallest baby. Here she comes. Hold on. For the continent's most iconic species, the stakes couldn't be higher. Wow. Yeah, look, 
here on the left, I mean, a, a, a large herd of elephants. It's, this is how elephants should be, you know, in their natural habitat. Tens of thousands lost each year, but not in Lewande. So there may be 20 elephants in a herd over there. They've been so successful in this park in protecting the elephants that there's just too many here. How do you how do you find audiences tend to respond to stories like this? I mean, you know, I'll sort of state the obvious of the five stories we've looked at. This one is not anything yeah. like the other four. And this is what uh, someone asked me earlier about um, balancing you know, news that you feel like people are really interested in and or, or have to know and stories that you're passionate about. Um, I think. You know, there has to be some light and shade in what we do. I mean, this is a really important story, but it's not all death and gloom and destruction. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's about, you know, elephant conservation. There are some, you know, uh, really harsh stats in that. But, mm -hmm. and, and going to your question about the resources, that this was, you know, it took a lot of, a, a big investment in time and resources mm -hmm. to do this story, but it, it was important to do. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I think people don't know uh, or didn't know about. I mean, they've run up hundreds of elephants in this and, and mm -hmm. moved them to the sanctuaries. It's, it was a really wonderful project and a great mm -hmm. story. And you know, it's it's good to do those stories. And absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, I'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, Chase is uh, somewhere. There he is. Uh, and so uh, he'll, uh, if you want to raise your hand, he'll bring a microphone to you, and we'll we've got uh, about 15 minutes or so for. Some questions for our guest. Hey, um, how do you feel about the mainstream media's portrayal of mass shooters, um, specifically with the Las Vegas shooter, um, where the focus is on the shooter and not the victims? Um, Could you hear uh, the question? Yeah, I did. That's a good question. Um, it's, a, it, it's a difficult. It's difficult to find the balance. I think we could be better. I think uh, I think we all need to be better, and and I know I, Anderson Cooper, who who I worked with for a long time, feels very strong about this. And when he does mass shooter stories, he he doesn't use the shooter's name because he doesn't want to give them more attention. Uh, he's you know one anchor on a network. Um, I think I, I agree. I think we should do we should focus on the on the victims more than we tend to. I think that the, the default of, to always kicking into the the who the the attacker is, is because these things are so difficult to understand that people are just trying to grasp a straw of some sort of understanding, something to make it make sense. Um, especially the Las Vegas shooting where it, there really was so little, uh, they didn't seem, especially in the early days, it didn't seem to be a, re, a rhyme or reason to it. So I think that's why there was a sort of fixation on, on him. But I, I think you're right. I think we, we absolutely could be better and we should be. And that's, you know, the, the, the media and the and news, it, it's, it, we're humans like, like the audience, so sometimes we'll, we'll have a human reaction to something that, that isn't necessarily the, 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 the best reaction, but you have to reset. And unfortunately, I, I think it's something that, that we'll keep having to cover, and which, is, which, which is a real tragedy in, in, in my view. Other questions? I'll ask another All question. Right. I mean, I can. Um, we have a good sized group of uh, journalism majors here, students who are studying journalism. Mm -hmm. So um, let's you know, go back in the, your time machine for a minute sure. here. What uh, bit of advice would you have wanted to hear when you were in college that you think would really have helped inform where you are now? Or perhaps if you, what advice might you offer journalism students today? I think that the two bits of advice for, for the journalism students, I think, um, sort of breadth of experience, that, you know, trying lots of different things, because I, my experience is that people who do, do really well um, aren't necessarily the ones who, who were very narrow focused in their studies. They're ones who also studied music and played sports and traveled and, you know, just took science classes and took English classes and just really had a really, really broad view because you never know when you're going to need that sort of stuff or that stuff will help you connect with somebody. Um, and then the, the other thing is just, is just get out there. I mean, the, the journalism is, is a contact sport. You can't be passive. You can't let stories come to you. You have to go out there. You have to talk to people. You know, don't be shy. Um, listen. You know, 
it's you, you everyone then tonight could go up you know go into one of the bars in in Oxford and just let, you know meet try, try to get something to tell you a story and and just simple skills like building that skills like, is is really will we'll come back and, and help you a thousand times over Carolina uh, my questions kind of mm -hmm two parts, but um, for the first one, what is the most dangerous story your, like one of your reporters has um, reported? And there's a lot of issues um, that come out with stories where you are going undercover and mm -hmm. just kind of the repercussions of that. So how do you decide, uh, especially with like the slave trade sure. story to put someone undercover and why it should be reported? Um, the most dangerous thing, the, I mean, we, I have guys who cover conflicts all the time. Um, that's one of the main things we do. The toughest one I've found since I've been running the region to get people to, to was the Ebola outbreak um, because it was, it, was, it was so much scarier than a war. I mean, bullets and bombs, you can sort of get your head around and, you can, and you can, there are things you can learn and do to, to mitigate the risk. You know, uh, the Ebola virus was this, this invisible thing that would you know, sort of kill you horribly and it, it was really really frightening and it was that I think was the the, the most nerve-wracking um, and, and and we never we I never ask anyone to go anywhere like I never tell someone to go they, they it's all voluntary um, I never have anybody any issues with people volunteering for Iraq or Syria I had a really hard time getting people to cover Ebola because it just was really, really frightening. Um, and then your second question, remind me just- well, Undercover. Oh, the undercover, yes. Um, there, there, there has to be a public service. There, there's a public service bar. You don't just do it because it looks cool. You don't just do it because it, it'll make your story a bit sexier. That you have to do it because there's no other way to tell the story. And there's some, some sort of public service is done by you doing that. Um, depending on locations, there's also, Significant legal restrictions in certain places, um, and you know we. It can be annoying, but we we talk to lawyers. Even, even going undercover in Libya, which is a, a largely lawless country, um, we sat down with our lawyer and said, "What what's the what are the legal ramifications of us doing this? And is it worth?" And so, so, you know, sometimes you'll make the the call. It'll be some place where legally it, it's questionable, but the story is that important that you say, "You know what? We're willing to take that risk." Um, in other places, you say there's really no legal risk for it. But you, you have to have that conversation beforehand. Because the worst thing, because if you do take that risk, and then later someone says, well, did you ever, ever even discuss it? If you say, yes, we discussed it, and I still, and I felt passionate, and I wanted to do it, that's one thing. If you say, they come back to you and say, did you ever discuss it? And you say, no, then you just look like an idiot, and you're just not prepared. You have other questions in the back? I'm curious, I don't need it, that's fine. No. Um, I'm curious what your vetting procedure is, especially when you've got the president of the United States. Yes. You specifically yeah. as fake news. And yeah. What does that look like? Uh, we have a pretty, we have a very extensive uh, vetting process, uh, which because the bar for us, especially right now in the current environment with, with the president, is so high that when we, you know, when CNN makes a mistake, uh, it becomes a story in itself. The New York Times writes stories about when when we make a mistake. Um, recently, we did have a, a story that that was published that didn't that I didn't m match our criteria. Um, within CNN, every story that's published, either uh, text or video, goes through a three-step process, which is legal, S&P, and what we call the row, which are sort of senior um, copy editors, fact checkers. Um, th and we had a piece that didn't go through that process. And people lost their jobs. I mean, we take it incredibly seriously um, because we had just have no, no margin for error, especially if it's anything related to the current administration or Russia. Um, so we take, you know, we, we, we don't, we'd rather be right than first. Um, I think that's, that's where media has changed in the, in the, the era of social media, is that you know, no one's ever gonna beat Twitter to a story, um, so why, tr why bother? So, and then who cares if they beat you there anyways. But what you can do is make sure you, you've got everything correct, every, every T crossed and I dotted. Um, it's, it is, especially now for our, our Russia stories, it could, uh, the Russia investigation stories go through a, a 
five-step process before publication. Do those include your lawyers? Do you do line by line with your attorneys? No, um, not line by line. It, it, depend, that's, that's not, it depends on the story. Um, it, you usually, most stories, you'll just sort of tell the lawyer, and then they sort of make the call. Um, our lawyers do, are not, our lawyers give us advice, they don't make editorial changes. So they will come to me and say, we're worried about this, but they won't, they won't change my words. Okay. Other questions? Okay. How is your coverage today influenced by your competitors at CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox News, et cetera? Um, well, I mean, honestly, at CNN International, where the vast majority of my, my coverage is, not, not much. Um, we do a hell of a lot more international news than, than most of our competitors. Um, we, we obviously watch what they're doing. And um, I uh, usually, if one of my reporters comes into my office and says, I want to do a story, and I say, why? And they say, because CBS did it. I'm like, well, that's not, that's not a good reason. <laughs> like, I, I, I have no interest in chasing other people's, other people's journalism. Um, I mean, we, sometimes you have to, but it's not something we, we, we do regularly. For CNN International, I think we, our competition that I pay the most attention to are, are probably uh, BBC and Al Jazeera rather than, than the American networks. Uh, my domestic colleagues here w would probably have a very different answer to that, but from, from my position, it's, it's not, not a lot. Yeah, Kristen. Have you ever regretted an editorial decision that you've made, like maybe something that you weren't sure about and then you just ran it anyway and then you uh, second guessed it? No, not, not I've, I've never ran something that I regret running. Not, again, because we have pretty robust sort of safeguards to prevent that. I have regretted um, making, because you can't cover the news like a shotgun. You can't just cover everything a little bit. And you, you sort of, you have to, what makes a tough, editor, tough editorial decisions tough is that you are often sacrificing something else to do something. And there have been times where I wish I had done more on a story or said, or maybe got to a bit later or and frankly, again, being human, didn't realize the importance of it or fast enough. I have regretted that. Um, I mean, my entire time at CNN, I've only had one piece not air that, that I worked on. Um, and, in high, and at the time, it was a, a piece in Iraq. Um, it was, it, going back to your earlier question about it, it was pretty graphic. At the time, I felt really passionate. And my bosses said it was too much. And now, now that I have a few years distance, I think they were right. Mm -hmm. They made the right call. Uh, but at the time, I'm right. If you'd asked me that question right then, I was I was quite angry about it. I really wanted that piece on there. So, other questions? Yes. So, kind of going off before about CNN and other competitors, what mm -hmm. about CNN makes you want to do work for it as opposed to another competitor? Um, that's a good question. I said this earlier, I think all, all news organizations are dysfunctional in their own beautiful way, and CNN is absolutely dysfunctional. But I think it, 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 it's, a, it's a really good organization in the sense that it lets us, lets us the journalists and the company, have a lot of freedom to, to go out and, and do things we're passionate about. I, I don't think a lot of our competitors would have, would have let us do the time in that, that uh, Mo Ali's piece for the, the elephants. Um, you know, taking four months to go to Macedonia to do something on fake news was a big investment. Um, they, especially the, the last few years, I think CNN's gone through a bit of a renaissance. Um, Jeff Zucker has taken over the company, and, and I'm not saying this because he's my boss, I'm saying this, but I believe this, and it's the, the sort of passion behind the journalism has really picked up. Um, it, it feels like a, an exciting place to work now. But I don't think we're unique, I think there's some, you know, there, I, a lot of news organizations are really good news organizations out there. And we talked about NPR earlier. I have a lot of friends at NPR, and I think it's, I think it's a brilliant organization. And I think they're you know, equally passionate. Um, New York Times, Washington Post, you know, uh, CBS, I think, does great international news. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Carolina. 
I like at a White House press briefing. You've had one question, but I'm going to let you have a second one. I don't need a microphone. Okay. I have a loud voice. Um, what is your process like for selecting reporters? I mean, obviously not mm. just the skills of the writing and editing, but like maybe like, like knowing different languages? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Arwa Damon and uh, actually in two of the, the reporters you saw speak Arabic. Um, uh, Nema is, is, is originally from Sudan. Arwa's mother is uh, Syrian. Um, ha having Arabic is, is huge, hugely beneficial, and especially in the Middle East, I mean, for obvious reasons. Um, I, I think diversity in the reporter pool is hugely important, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also it, it, it's, it's the easy right thing to do because it's, it actually be makes it better for the job because there you know, they're, they're certain people who fit stories and can go places where other people can't go and can get access that other people can't get because they're from there or they know somebody or they, they, they speak the language or know the customs. Um, so I think that the, the, the more, as, as an editor, you know, the more diversity is, the more tools in my toolbox, so the, more, the, the more ways I have to cover a story. Um, you have to be able to write. Are they good? the youngest reporter you hired? The youngest? Well, that's a good question. Probably in mid 20s, I would guess. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't know, age really, ma really matters necessarily. Um, I think that's probably unusual, but it's, it, it, it does happen. Any other questions? I'll end with this. Um, and then we'll wrap up. I'll put my academic uh, cap on for a second. Degrees in political science uh, and then uh, fine arts. Mm -hmm. So we're here in a college of arts and sciences in a safe space, studying the liberal arts, where all of our students in this department are required to earn a second degree mm -hmm. outside of what they study with us. So how do you sort of translate uh, your academic background and what did you, what can you take from those studies? Uh, we don't have a journalism degree next to your name, which is, which I think a lot of people would say is perfectly fine. But what can you offer students in terms of thinking, you know, sometimes in studying the liberal arts, how am I going to apply these broad skills to an actual profession? What, what did you learn in your liberal arts background that you apply today? Well, it's studying political science, I think, is hugely beneficial because a lot of, I do a lot of politics. Um, you know, my fine arts background, I really learned how to use a camera. I mean, it, was, it was very technical, um, so I use those technical skills a lot. Uh, being able to write is, is I cannot under, under stress that. It's just, um, it, it's the foundation for everything, for TV, for, you know, the, the, uh, and, uh, Again, like I said earlier, I think having a breadth of interest and knowledge, it, it helps you and just, just makes you stronger and, and more versatile and, and, um, and just better able to tell stories. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me say a couple of thank yous as we wrap up. I'd like to thank the Department of Media, Journalism and Film for sponsoring our event tonight. I'd like to specifically uh, uh, thank uh, Patty Newberry for organizing tonight's event. Uh, in the back, I'd like to thank Steve Beitzel and Ringo Jones and, and their students for, for the production tonight. They've done a terrific job with that. And I'd like to thank our students, our students for coming out. Uh, welcome back from Thanksgiving break. Welcome back to school. And, uh, and, and uh, thank those folks watching at home as well. And of course, our guest, Tommy. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.